Today we're going to start talking about something called hypothesis testing. A study published in the Journal of the Air and Waste Management Association reported that the mean amount of particulate matter produced by cars and light trucks in an urban setting is 35 milligrams of PM per mile of travel. Suppose that a new engine design is proposed that is intended to reduce the amount in the air. There are two possible outcomes that could happen with a new engine design. Either the new design will reduce the level or it won't. These possibilities are called hypotheses. And one of them is called the null hypothesis and the other is called the alter alternate. So let's take a look at that. So the null hypothesis. states that the parameter is equal to a specific value. And we usually call that mu with a little zero, um, the mean, null, the null mean, the null value. And we represent it with an H with a little zero. Null, zero change, no change. Null usually means nothing, no change. The alternate, Hypothesis denoted with H with a one is the alternate to that. And there's, and there's really um, three alternatives. The first one is that we are less than the value. that our true mean is less than the null value. We call this a left tail hypothesis, to the left, left tail, less than. Well, we could also be greater than the value. That would mean that the true mean is actually greater than where we started, than that null value. This is called a right tail because we're talking about being to the right of that value, greater than that value. The last option is just that we are not equal to the value. Now, if we are not equal to the value, so that means the mean is not equal to whatever the original null value was, we could either be less than or greater than. And we call this a two-tail because it could be either less than or greater than. So let's look at some examples. <clears throat> Boxes of a certain kind of cereal are labeled as containing 20 ounces. An inspector thinks that the mean weight may be less than this. So we wanna state the null hypothesis and the alternative. And, and we're gonna write it in words and in, in numbers. So the null hypothesis is that there is no difference. The mean weight is still 20 ounces. So in notation, that would mean that the mean is 20. Okay. Well, the alternative that what the inspector is giving as an alternate is that it may be less than this. So the mean weight is less than the advertised 20 ounces. So that would mean that the mean would be less than 20. Now this would be considered a left tail test. Less than left tail. 
another example. Last year, the mean monthly rent for an apartment in a certain city was $800. That's going to give me my null hypothesis that the mean rent is $800. The mean is $800. A real estate agent believes that the mean rent is actually higher this year. So the alternative being proposed is the mean rent is, oops, is greater. So mean is greater than 800. This would be considered a right tail test. We're looking at the right being greater than. Scores on a standardized test have a mean of 70. That's my null. Mean score is 70. The mean is 70. Some modifications are made to the test and an educator believes that the mean may have changed. Is he saying that it's greater or less? No, he's just saying it's different. The mean score is not 70. So he's proposing that the mean is not 70. This would be considered a two-tail test because it could either be greater or less. Now, the purpose of a hypothesis test is to determine how likely it is that the null hypothesis is still true. And the idea behind these tests is kind of like a criminal trial. At the beginning of the trial, we assume the defendant is innocent until proven guilty, right? So we assume that the null hypothesis is true, innocent until proven guilty. We always assume the null hypothesis is true. Then we look at the evidence, and that's coming from the data that we collect, from a sample usually. If the data strongly indicates that the null hypothesis is false, we can abandon our assumption that it is true and believe the alternate instead. We call this rejecting the null hypothesis. So we have to decide whether we're gonna reject the null hypothesis or not. And, and the way we state it is we're either going to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We had already assumed that somebody was innocent until proven guilty. At the end of the trial, they're either gonna reject that they're innocent and for the, the option that they're guilty, or we're not gonna reject that they're innocent. At the end of a the trial, they never actually say they've been proven innocent. Notice that they never say that somebody is proven innocent. We assume that they were innocent from the, the beginning. Okay, so if the null hypothesis is rejected, then we can conclude that the alternative must be true. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, we are saying there's not enough evidence to support the alternate. We are not saying the null hypothesis is true, we're just saying it might be true. We just don't have any evidence to prove otherwise. So boxes of a certain kind of cereal are labeled as 20 ounces. An inspector thinks the weight, mean weight may be less than this. So he performs the test with the null being that the mean is 20. And the alternate is the mean is less than 20. After he finishes his test, he rejects the null hypothesis. Now, if he rejects the null hypothesis, then he's rejecting the fact that we are equal to 20. If he rejects it, then we can conclude that the mean weight is less than 20 ounces. Now, what if he does not reject the null hypothesis?
if he does not reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to conclude that the mean weight is less than 20 ounces. We do not have enough evidence to support that claim. Now, when a hypothesis test is conducted and a decision is made, there's a possibility that we made the wrong decision. And there's two ways we can make a wrong decision. The first one is, what if the null hypothesis is true, but we reject it? We found evidence that rejected the fact that that suspect was innocent, even though he was. The other option is that the null hypothesis is false, but we fail to reject it. In the case of a court trial, that would mean that we didn't have enough evidence to find them guilty. So we let them walk. Here's a chart of those different options. If the null hypothesis is true and we reject that null, we're putting an innocent man in prison. This is called a type one error. Now, if the null hypothesis is false and we fail to reject it, that's type two. The dean of a business school wants to determine whether the mean starting salary of graduates of her school is greater than 50,000. She'll perform a hypothesis test with the following null and alternative hypothesis. So the null is that it is 50,000. The alternative is it's greater than 50,000. Suppose that the true mean is 50,000, but the dean rejected the null hypothesis. If the mean is 50,000, so the null hypothesis was true, but we rejected it, that is type one. Now let's say same test, but the true mean is 55,000 and the dean rejects the null. Okay, so he rejects that it's 50,000 and assumes it's greater and it is greater. That's a correct decision. Same situation, null of 50,000, alternate is it's greater than 50,000. The true mean is 55,000, but the Dean does not reject the null. He's saying, I don't have enough evidence that it's greater than 50,000, but it really is. That's a type two. So that chart will come in handy on telling whether it's a type one or type two error. Okay. 